Adventures in Mortuary Archaeology and Commemoration. It's Archeo Death. Hello Archeo Death fans, and it's another lovely day on lockdown. And I thought I'd come out to my local cemetery to talk to you rather than uh, from an office-based location and talk to you a little bit further about uh, my uh, published book, edited book, Archaeologists and the Dead, um, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2016, about four years ago, and it remains available in hardback, hardback book, it's a short-run academic book, so it's a high-priced uh, quality book, um, um, but uh, perhaps not fully as accessible as it might be in terms of broader readership and it's edited by myself with Dr Melanie Giles of Manchester University and um, in an earlier video I gave a review of the rationale for the book and the introduction and the contents it's split into three it's an edited book with uh, an introduction by me and Melanie and then uh, a, a sort of reflective review by Lynn Goldstein uh, the eminent uh, US archeo based archaeologist uh, who's done a lot of work on mortuary archaeology throughout her career. And we have a preface by, um, uh, not preface, a uh, foreword by uh, Professor Mike Parker Pearson, a well known and uh, very eminent uh, mortuary archaeologist, too. Um, and in between that, we have um, 19 chapters, um, sorry, 18 chapters that, uh, that, uh, that approach. Um, the relationship of archaeologists to contemporary mortuary practices and perceptions through the, the way in which we act as dealers with the dead, we engage with the dead, whether it's um, through field work, whether it's through the media, whether it's through museums and collections, we are mediators of, of mortality for many people. And we, uh, people who go to museums and uh, read about archaeology are fascinated with mortuary archaeology. It's one of the most popular ways into the subject. And there's lots of cliches, and there's lots of misinformation out there about mortuary archaeologists, what we do. There's lots of disparaging comments uh, made about archaeologists because we investigate graves. Um, and uh, a lot of that mis uh, misinformation comes from misunderstandings about why we do it and the vast amount of valuable information it provides us um, to understand not only the past but also our present. Um, but our book tries to look at this in a broad context and we evaluate it through a whole series of chapters. The first part, Investigating the Dead, has uh, six chapters looking at field work and how we work with different communities and stakeholder groups in different ways around the world from first world war battlefields to um, Arizona cemeteries and, and, and working with Native American communities and, and, and also we have a second section looking at the different ways globally and locally we display the dead in museums in different fashions and in different ways and the third section looks at our relationship with the media our relationship to contemporary society and contemporary attitudes to death and the dead and also uh, to neo-pagan groups where well, I work with artists and our work as writers so the various different intersections between archaeologists as researchers and the broader canvas of of relationships we have in contemporary 21st century uh, UK and beyond with the dead and with death and with dying so in the second video, I want to focus on my contribution to this debate because I, I, am, I am mainly a, an expert in the uh, early Middle Ages and the archaeology of the 5th to 7th uh, centuries particularly, but increasingly in the last decade and a bit I've worked in the in, uh, moving from the Anglo-Saxon, the early Anglo-Saxon period into the Middle Anglo-Saxon period and also into the Viking Age and studying the 9th to 11th centuries in Britain and Scandinavia. But um, I'm also aware as I visit museums, as I visit, uh, I've long been aware of, of the, the various different ways and, and, and uh, manifestations of the archaeology of death in museums. And on my Archaeo Death blog, which uh, these videos are, are connected to, I explore and critically evaluate some of the choices made about how we display the dead in museums and the ways in which we write with our text panels, our artwork, to uh, the way we reconstruct grave contexts in museums, all the different ways the dead are manifest in our 
phys physically present in museums. And um, one of the, in another paper, which I'll talk about in another video, I, I do evaluate the fact that actually often we um, miss uh, a lot of key factors with our focus on um, big museums. We are, most of our ethical debates focus on, perhaps obsessively, on national museums. Um, museums with an international audience and a global remit to write the human story. And that should be part of the debate, but often we miss the fact that many, in, in the UK and elsewhere, many of our local and regional museums, our town and city museums, are, 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 are stacked full of curated material from excavations, including artefacts and graves, grave structures, but also human remains themselves. And linked to that, I, I'll come on to that point in another video, but in, in this video I want to talk about the fact that actually there's a lot of um, neglect for the cremated dead. Now cremation as a funerary practice varies across time and space and we find it in many many different places and times um, and it, to understand cremation it's taken a lot of extra work for archaeologists because we're, we're dealing with uh, fragmented, distorted um, um, remains of past funerals and uh, for many generations archaeologists was just wrote off cremated materials I mean, there's nothing we can learn from it um, but in the last 50 years and in particular in the last 20-25 years um, archaeologists are not only taking uh, a much greater care in the field uh, you know extraction and excavation of cremated deposits uh, uh, but also um, um, microscopic analyses, chemical analyses and other ways of investigating cremated bone and the mortuary context they come from. And uh, in my contribution to this book, I, I did a chapter, chapter 14, Firing the Imagination, Cremation in the Museum. And I, I made the point that almost exclusively all previous debate about human remains and how and why and should we... Uh, display the dead, um, focus almost exclusively on unburnt human bodies. And indeed the default has tended to be perversely towards some of the most exceptionally preserved human remains, the bog bodies and the mummies. And still our ethical debates do fixate on those perhaps to the you know exclusion of other remains. And cremated human remains are uh, ubiquitous in our museum collections, are ubiquitous across different societies um, and different times in the past. Therefore, they enter our museums and they're present in our museums. And yet often we don't, we don't incorporate them in our discussions. And I, I try to start off by making the point that actually some of the most controversial um, discussions of recent times have focused on cremated remains. For example, I, I talk about the fact that the, the that some of the discussions um, and, and ethical debates about Stonehenge uh, before and um, and during the opening of the new visitor centre in 2014, the excavations done by Mike Parker Pearson in the Aubrey holes um, elicited strong reactions from pagan groups about um, um, the intervention into. Um, 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 the, 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 the site of Stonehenge and the display of the remains of the dead at Stonehenge because in the late Neolithic phase of Stonehenge, the actual building phases of Stonehenge, uh, the cremation seems to be the, 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 the principal mode of disposal, at least for those groups who are being interred at that special site. So cremated human remains do are a challenge for us to investigate and are actually, they don't look as human and therefore often gets ignored by visitors and the broader public. And yet, some cremated human bodies of, from ancient times are the focus of some intense ethical debates and um, stakeholder and, and community uh, reactions to archaeological work. Some of them protest, some of them close affinity. And I also make the point that actually um, some of our biggest and most impressive ancient monuments in Northern Europe are associated with cremation practices. Think, for example, um, the great mounds at Gamla Uppsala, um, outside of the modern Swedish city of Uppsala, um, well known in, for students of uh, late Iron Age archaeology and Viking period archaeology, um, because the site becomes um, um, gets recorded by Adam and Bremen as um, a pagan temple, a great, great pagan temple of the Sphere, and uh, it becomes the site of the first sort of uh, um, church or cathedral uh, of the of the Swedes. 
and and that the, the three great mounds there, and there there were more uh, great mounds. One of them, uh, the, uh, two or th well, two or three of them may have been uh, d denuded and damaged deliberately in the 12th, 13th century, uh, and, and 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 um, adapted one as a thing mound. But the the three that have been investigated, you know, are cremation uh, uh, covering crema cremation deposits. Those three great mounds. Think of the many of the burial mounds of the early Bronze Age around Stonehenge, some of which contain inhumation graves. But many are multiple period, multiple stage constructions involving the cremated dead um, increasingly and to a large degree. And, and I also make the point that the largest burial mounds that we have from the British Isles are Roman burial mounds, the Bartlow Hills in Essex, and they are over, they are covering, they're monuments covering cremation, cremated early mid-Roman cremation. Uh, uh, ceremonies, the remains of cremation ceremonies. So I start off by making the point that actually while we tend to ignore the cremated dead there's some very controversial and very prominent instances of cremation in the human past that do capture the imagination and are a prominent focus of archaeological research. And I proceed then to talk about the fact that our attitudes to modern cremation are partly an issue here and that we have a whole series of challenges intersecting past and present experiences of cremation. You know, internal open air cremation in, in the past and the ceremonies before, during and after it are at one level very similar to cremation today. Another level, because they all involve uh, multiple stages, burning the dead, distributing ashes, you can partition them, take them home, you can bury them in, in, in a sacred site or in and around sacred sites, including churchyards like the one I'm currently sitting in. But we can also, um, we, 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 you know, there are incredible differences and our ability to engage with the dead is very different. So I talk about the fact that, that, that that's, that's, that's part of the problem. But then I equally, as a flip side, make the point that actually many of our more earlier cremation, crematoria Golders Green um, and that the cemeteries associated with them like Stockholm Southern Cemetery are themselves world heritage sites or at least listed protected heritage environments so the heritage of cremation is not simply about prehistory and the long stretches of time in prehistory and cremation was practiced the Roman period the ancient world the Etruscans the Greeks not only um, the, the Anglo-Saxons and Vikings uh, up to Christianization, which tended to knock cremation out reasonably rapidly, uh, but that's a whole area of debate. But also moving forward to the rise of cremation in the modern world. That's part of the archaeological investigation uh, of cremation, is the story of the rise of our most common wide global disposal method. So it's an important story to foreground cremation in our investigations. And so when we get to museums, I, I make the point that perhaps not, not, not a failing of any individual, but as a collective failing of archaeological professionals, we perhaps haven't given enough attention to cremation in the way we communicate stories about the human past and about past death ways. Whether we're dealing with the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Roman period, the Anglo-Saxon period, or indeed the, uh, the 19th and early 20th centuries. And so I I try in my paper to identify a typology of cremation on display, the way we use te um, text and audio commentaries, artefacts and vessels, cinnery urns, other kinds of ash chest that are used to that were used to contain the dead, often without the cremated remains still associated with them, memorials and monuments associated with the cremated dead, cremated bones themselves, um, the use of mock-up associations between artefacts, urns and ashes. Um, reconstructions of grave contexts are quite common. We even have museums that reconstruct um, past architectures, monuments and cemetery environments through art. Um, sometimes photographs and section plans and plan, um, sections and plans from archaeological excavations are used in the displays to communicate um, the death rituals. Artists and models um, and impressions and uh, sometimes historical, literary and ethnographic accounts are brought into play to communicate the story. And I, I then use four very different case studies to, to, to um, explain cremation in, as it appears in the museum. And I, I start with an open air museum, the Hemstead Altidsparken in, uh, in, in Denmark, 
which I visited as part of an archaeological conference uh, field trip uh, when I was a member of the International Saxon Symposium, um, international scholars talking about the, the Northern Europe in the mid to late first millennium AD came together at a conference at Hardislev and we went to the um, the open air museum which is on the site of um, um, very important uh, archaeological excavations of an Iron Age settlement, multi-base Iron Age settlement and cemeteries and, and I, I, I talked about how the cremated dead are displayed within that museum and then I move on from and a very intelligent and, and, and curatorial decisions made about displaying the dead within the floor so you can look down onto mock graves, um, a, a fragmented remains are reconstructed on the skeleton vertically and also there are sort of um, displays of uh, cinerary urns with cremated human bodies and artefacts together. And I complemented that, I contrasted that with a town mu a museum in the UK. I looked at Colchester Castle Museum which I know has subsequently been redisplayed. And I looked at a range of ways from their Bronze Age and Iron Age, Belgic, the Lexton Tumulus is on display there. Also Roman funerary practice, uh, child's graves uh, and tombstones and columbaria and, and, uh, and so on are, are very prominent on the displays in the Colchester Museum where grave context reconstructed. And, and so you end up, if you go to Colchester, well, when I visited then, Going to Colchester Museum was about actually um, seeing a whole host of different ways in which the cremated dead could be treated and displayed. Having done an open air museum and a town museum, I then went to a county museum and I went back to Denmark. Well, I didn't go back, it was on the same trip. Um, and I took a look at Had Hardesleft's Museum of Southern Jutland. Um, and I talk about the, the many ways in which there are cremated human remains on display in that museum from Denmark's oldest grave uh, is actually a cremation grave on display um, a, a mesolithic uh, a deposit um, through prehistory in different phases we sit, we're given a whole urnfield cemetery with urns packed in to illustrate how the cemetery how these cemeteries were constructed and developed through time so a really again intelligent and an interesting range of ways in which the cremated dead appear in the archaeological uh, displays and my final case study was a national museum so yes I said most of the discussion focuses on national museums I did go back to a national museum and I look at the Nat National Historical Museum in Stockholm and there I, 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 I take forward the discussions of a number of other scholars about that museum and I talk about how there are actually a huge number of different ways in which um, that one museum articulates and expresses um, the, the dead of different periods. For example, there's a whole display about children um, in the Bronze Age with six burial assemblages um, put together of, of child's graves with tiny cremated remains and the artifacts associated with them. And I think that was a very evocative and, and different way of, of, of communicating death in the past rather than focusing on the elites, rather than focusing on high powerful women and men to, to look at the graves of children, um, as well as other periods where some very wealthy and elaborate cremation burials are, 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 are narrated, including the Scherpingsvik uh, uh, from Erland, um, heathen woman of power, with all of the, uh, she was cremated in, in a ship with all manner of um, animals and, and a, 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 a seer's staff. She is one of these uh, supposed, uh, you know, sort of um, seer's graves, a volver's grave, a sort of grave of a, of a, of a, a woman of magic and high status uh, in some mix of associations. And so, and we also have in the Viking display the Aldershire um, brown hair that was survived uh, from a um, cremation and um, just opposite on the on the on, on the on the land opposite the famous Viking town of Birka. So we have this kind of. Um, a rich range of ways in which one encounters the cremated dead to tell the stories about the human past and you know obviously as every modern visitor visits these cr past cremations maybe they're not only learning about those ancient cremation remains but they're reflecting on their own decisions and their own options in disposing of the dead today a society where we are one of those prominent ways in which 
the dead are disposed of with funerals and often now in, in the lockdown and especially without funeral people in attendance at funerals is, is cremation so through the museum I'm suggesting in this chapter we are not only through our global museums in different ways we are not only encountering uh, bodies bog bodies and mummies coming face to face with the dead we're also having to contend with the dead in fragments and how cremation um, across time in different very different religious and cultural contexts cremation is one option often uh, um, just one among many options used to dispose of the dead and, and, and museum curators visiting public and field archaeologists academic archaeologists we all need to remember cremation and critically tackle how we communicate in the stories of cremation to not sideline cremation to not ignore the cremated dead to not see it as just a cheap or um, casual choice because many of the choices people make today about whether they how they how and where they're going to be disposed of are personal intimate motivated by religious and cultural factors um, and the same would apply to the past too. So by writing about cremation in the museum, I stray out of my area of expertise a little bit, um, although I've worked with cremated material and what we understand about the human past, and I've tried to look at um, how we display in the museums. And I'm not a museum archaeologist primarily, but I, I saw it as a neglected area of research, and I thought this would be an opportunity to make a contribution to that debate. And so I'm very pleased and proud to, it was a great joy working with uh, Mel Giles, who anyone who knows her as a, and her work uh, will be, will attest to, to the, the charisma and the um, articulate and visionary nature of her archaeological writings. And uh, it was a real privilege to work with Mel uh, on this project and work with um, 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 pairs of authors and single authors contributing eight, um, uh, 18 uh, original chapters and then work, having Lynn do a, 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 a sort of a concluding chapter 20 uh, was, was, was a great benefit to the volume too. So um, this book, four years on, uh, remains I think a very important and perhaps neglected collection and I thought these videos would bring it to your attention and uh, give you an explanation of what, what, what uh, the book as a whole was trying to achieve and, and at least as a case study I've illustrated what, what my chapter was about. So I hope that, uh, that this video has been of some use and uh, of interest. Um, remember you can uh, find on Academia, Academia Edu and increasingly on the Humanities Commons site I'm putting up some of my publications um, and I will continue to do that. I want to have this work out there and used by students, scholars and the public as much as possible. And uh, my Archeo Death blog, I've got uh, over, well, I can't even remember how many, 1,400 blog posts looking at how we interpret uh, traces of the dead in the past and how we present them in the present and a lot of my posts also reflect on contemporary death rituals and commemorative environments. So do dip, dip into my um, WordPress blog if you would like more um, to read uh, in these lockdown times about the archaeology of death, burial and commemoration. So that's all from me for now from uh, a very sunny early morning in a churchyard in North Wales. And uh, uh, take care. If you've enjoyed this archaeo death video, why not check out the Archaeodeath blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com.